All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let's get started. So I just want to give us a little bit of a recap as to where we are and why we're there, because sometimes we get mired down like three or four lectures in and people are going like, what are we doing? Okay, so this is just a little recap as to where we're at and why we're talking about what we're talking about. Okay, so we prefaced the entire course, actually. We started by saying we were going to put together uh, a couple of systems in order to make something bigger happen. So in order to control a regulated variable, and we said, okay, the, uh, the regulated variable we're going to pick is mean arterial pressure, okay? And then we talked about how we'd have to have sensors for that, where places in the coordinating system or the brainstem in order to control that, and then communication between that uh, coordinating center, that brainstem, and some pieces of tissue in order to help us control that regulated variable, right? And we talked about those effector pieces of tissue being muscle, cardiac or smooth muscle, as well as tapping into our glands, okay? So we have been thinking about those effectors and we've been working on that cardiac uh, component, okay? So we looked at the, um, the electrical system of the heart, okay? And then we looked at how the the brain stem would then control that piece, right? Because you already know now about the, how the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system control that electrical system and therefore control heart rate, okay? And then we started, we turned that electrical system, we saw how it communicated with muscle. So we turned that electrical system and that muscle into a pump and looked at pressure volume loops and started moving blood out of the heart, okay? So we turned it into a pump and we started looking at cardiac output, okay? I'm gonna write on this, but this is just sheerly review, okay? We started looking at cardiac output uh, of the heart and we talked about stroke volume, how that was determined by stroke volume and heart rate. Okay, so this is where that heart rate, that electrical system is gonna be tapping in to change output of the heart. And then we had to start thinking about the pump or uh, how about the, um, the volume per beat, okay? So we started thinking about that volume per beat. We thought about like cardiac output, that stroke volume is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume times heart rate. Okay, we talked a little bit about that end diastolic volume, but that's essentially preload, blood that will be coming back to the heart. So we have to talk for about another four lectures before we get blood back to the heart because we've got to go through all the blood vessels first. Okay, so we are going to revisit preload when we know a little bit more. Okay, and then we're going to think, then we started thinking about end systolic volume. Okay, so how much blood was left in the heart after systole? And that's going to be dictated by how hard the muscle contracts, so heart contractility. So now, how do we now then control heart rate contractility? Okay, so this is where we are now. You saw some intrinsic ways in which we control contractility, right? The length tension curve of the muscle. If you fill that chamber a little bit more, you better align the cross bridges and you get more force, more contraction. Okay, more force, more contraction, higher stroke volume, higher cardiac output, okay? So I, you also looked at a second intrinsic way, a, a weird way in which heart rate and contractility were automatically related. An increase in heart rate meant an increase in force, so we're not sure how they're related, okay? But we saw that relationship. So those are two things that are just gonna automatically happen because that's how this tissue is built, okay? Essentially, like why do we, why are we, why do we care about this cardiac output? Is this, we will move, once we get through the heart, we will move into blood vessels. We care about this cardiac output because that output is about to go into the aorta. And where do we measure mean arterial pressure? In the aorta. Okay, so anything that messes with cardiac output of the heart is going to mess with mean arterial pressure. Okay, so just to kind of put into a little bit of a context where we are. So we are going to continue today to think about contractility of the heart, 
not the intrinsic mechanisms, though, because we can't control them, right? So those things that we talked about, they're just going to happen. There's no control over those, okay? We want to talk about this piece, okay? How do we control, how does the brain control uh, end systolic volume or contractility in order for it to be a tool to help us control mean arterial pressure? Okay, so today we're going to be looking at, we're going to be starting the lecture looking at extrinsic controllers of contractility, and it's going to be no surprise that we're going to head to the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system to do that. Okay? All right, so let's jump into nervous innervation into the heart into those cardiac myocytes. We're talking about myocytes now. Okay, we're not talking about those nodal cells. Two separately different innervated systems, okay? So we're gonna be talking about extrinsic controllers, okay? So these are uh, regulation. You get extrinsic control when you regulate uh, by factors originating from outside the tissue. Okay, so intrinsic control was factors regulating it from within the tissue. Extrinsic control is going to be factors related from outside the tissue. So the nervous system coming in and synapsing onto a myocyte is now, uh, to change its behavior, is now going to be extrinsic control. So let's just make sure we get that definition down. Uh, regulation, so extrinsic means Regulation by factors originating outside the tissue. Okay, so here we're talking about direct nervous innervation into cardiac myocytes. Okay, so this is not going to change heart rate, right, because you can only change heart rate if you're going to tap into that nodal cell. Okay, so this is going to change contractility, force of contraction. So the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine onto the cardiac myocytes. Okay, and this is just the exact signal, intercellular signaling pathway that they've mapped out. Norepinephrine um, is released onto the cardiac myocytes, specifically a beta adrenergic membrane receptor population. Okay, so this is just how that cell, how the cardiac myocyte even knows that norepinephrine exists, is to have a membrane receptor population for it. Okay, and then the response to that norepinephrine is going uh, to be dictated by what binding uh, or occupying that beta membrane receptor does. Okay, what does that do on the inside? Okay, so we get to change a second messenger. So beta adrenergic membrane receptor, we change a G protein. It's called GS, G stimulatory. Okay, a G protein, which is going to increase adenylate cyclase, increase cyclic A. So there's our second messenger. Okay, increase a bunch of protein kinase. Don't really care about all those steps. And then we change the phosphorylation state. Okay, so that's just your really general scheme. If you go back to human phys one, your really general scheme for how um, one cell communicates with another. Okay, so what do we increase the phosphorylation of? We increase the phosphorylation of voltage-dependent calcium channels. Okay, so you remember when we um, had excitation, we had the action potential coming down a ventricular myocyte. And at some point, when we, ch we uh, so first we opened voltage-gated sodium channels and we changed the membrane potential. And then when we did that, we opened voltage-gated calcium channels. And that let calcium into a myocyte, which was the trigger for contraction. Okay, so that's a set of voltage-gated channels. There appear to be in there as well a set of voltage-gated channels that don't open during that process. You have to phosphorylate them first, and once they're in that phosphorylation state, now per action potential, they will open. 
Okay, so this is kind of a control system where we have this, these voltage-gated uh, calcium channels laid into the membrane and waiting to open if they were only phosphorylated first. Okay, so in the presence of norepinephrine, we have this, these phosphorylated channels, so we open more per action potential. Okay? So opening more channels per action potential, again, that was that trigger calcium. We've got more trigger calcium now for calcium-induced calcium release, more calcium on the inside of the cell, more force, okay? Because we are talking about a myocyte here. All right, I'm going to increase my trigger calcium, calcium-induced calcium release from the SR, actin myosin, all that kind of junk, and we get an increase in contractility, increase in force, okay? Okay, we get an increase in force generated. But we're also going to see phosphorylation of, once we've got our protein kinases up and running, is a phosphorylation of the calcium pumps on the SR. All right, so these calcium pumps also uh, were the ones, were uh, part of the process that was in charge of, once intracellular calcium was in the cell, we had to get rid of it, right? Because um, in order to relax the cell. So we put a bunch of pumps up on the membrane, some exchangers on the membrane to pump it back into the extracellular space, but we also had pumps on the sarcoplasmic reticulum on the inside so we can hide that calcium from the intracellular space, tuck it away in a little membrane-bound vesicle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay? So we're going to increase their activity, so now they're churning faster, okay? Which is gonna drop our relaxation time, and we're gonna increase our speed of contraction. Okay. So if we were to look at our myocyte behavior in terms of the force it generates, and let's say this was just the normal force that we would generate under a normal twitch contraction per action potential, okay. then on beta stimulation we would get more force. Right, So because of that uh, increase, uh, those phosphorylated voltage-dependent calcium channels, more force, and then so more calcium would be released in this, into the cytoplasm. But then we would get rid of it quicker because those calcium pumps are phosphorylated and working faster. Okay, so you'd have a long, you'd have a uh, more force for less time, okay? So this is what the force profile would look like on beta stimulation. Okay, and that was because of a sympathetic nervous system or a nervous response. Okay, so that's the consequence of stimulating so now uh, simulating with the sympathetic nervous system. So now we have a system hooked up that the brain can now communicate with the heart to say contract harder, generate more force, eject more volume. Okay, so now, and that volume is going into the aorta, changing mean arterial pressure. So this is one of our tools to change mean arterial pressure. So we can also turn that down the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine, so we're gonna have to switch it. If we want this myocyte to even know the parasympathetic nervous system is communicating with it, we have to have a, uh, a membrane receptor population on the cardiac myocyte. So we have a muscarinic cholinergic membrane receptor population, okay? This was different from that nicotinic cholinergic membrane receptor population that you saw when you contracted muscle. You open some ion channels with that here. This is metabotropic. So now we're going to change a G protein. This is an inhibitory G protein, which inhibits acetyl or adenylate cyclase. So because you can see all the system did, it used the exact, it's gonna use the exact same process. It switched a membrane receptor and switched the G protein. Okay, that's all it had to do, because then if I can switch that G protein to inhibit adenylate cyclase, I can shut this whole system down. I do the exact opposite of this now. 
Okay. So with that inhibitory protein, drop adenylate cyclase, drop cyclic aid, decrease the protein kinase activity, and decrease the phosphorylation of voltage-dependent calcium channels and pumps on the SR. Okay, so the system didn't do anything wild and crazy other than it had to get itself a new membrane receptor population, switch to G protein, and we can reverse the whole thing, okay? So indeed, if uh, we were the parasympathetic nervous system, we would contract with less force because we have less voltage-dependent channels, and it would take more time for that contraction to occur because the calcium would linger in that cytosolic space longer before the SR picked it up and hid it away. Okay, so we're gonna get a contraction with less force, and it's going to be longer. So this is what the force profile would look like with muscarinic cholinergic stimulation. Okay, and we're gonna get that from the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so perfect. In terms of contractility and stroke volume, we now have a way to turn it up and turn it down, and the brain can do that. Okay. So that would be the nervous control. Okay, so now the hormonal control of that system. I'm gonna bring this back, so I'll put that there. The hormonal control over the system. This is us now going down to, though, remember we had uh, the different effectors. We had cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and then I also put glands in there under effectors. This is us going to a gland, okay? The sympathetic nervous system is directly innervates the adrenal gland, which is gonna release epinephrine, mostly, and a little bit of norepinephrine into the bloodstream, and once we have and norepinephrine into the bloodstream, whoever has a receptor population for either of those two will be stimulated, okay? And we just decorated a cardiac myocyte with beta adrenergic membrane receptors. So it doesn't matter where the epinephrine or norepinephrine is coming from, if it has a membrane receptor for it and it's exposed to it, it'll respond in exactly the same way, okay? So whether norepinephrine came from the, from the sympathetic nervous system and bound to that beta adrenergic membrane receptor population, or the adrenal glands got stimulated, put norepinephrine and epinephrine into the bloodstream, that circulated around, found that membrane receptor population, okay? The results will be exactly the same as what happened with direct nervous innervation, okay? Because this, the, the cell does not know where this norepinephrine or where this beta adrenergic stimulation came from. It just knows I'm stimulated and here's what I do, okay? So indeed, once we get to uh, releasing epi into the blood, okay, so this now is gonna be our bloodstream. Okay, so this is going to be classic hormonal communication. It's going to take a little bit longer. Okay, so you start to see the body is building systems that can that can control tissues on different time scales. Right? If you stimulate a myocyte with a nerve, you can get it changed in milliseconds. If you stimulate if you have a nerve stimulate the adrenal glands to release a hormone into the bloodstream and it has to circulate around that's gonna take seconds to minutes to get there. So it's starting to set up. The exact same thing is gonna happen, but the time scale is a little bit different, okay? And we're not gonna be able to really introduce time as a really integrative concept until we get near the end, but it's gonna come back to bite us for sure. Okay, so once we get the beta adrenergic membrane receptor stimuli, uh, population stimulated on this cell, the results are gonna be exactly the same as sympathetic nervous system stimulation, okay? So 
results. Results will be exactly the same as sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Okay, so looking over here then, indeed not only will we get an increase in force and uh, for less time through beta stimulation from the sympathetic nervous system, we're going to get that from um, our hormonal response as well. Okay, so this is going to be the exact same thing because it's the exact same membrane receptor we're after if we use epinephrine or norepi uh, to stimulate with a, as a, in the hormonal response. Turning the system down doesn't seem to happen in the same way. We don't tap into a gland to release acetylcholine into the blood to then turn the system down. That doesn't seem, to be a, doesn't seem to be a thing the body is wired to do, okay? The adrenergic system seems to have both nervous support and hormonal support, but the parasympathetic nervous system doesn't. So we're not going to see the same type of hormonal response to support this, okay? Don't seem to be built that way. Okay, so we've got hormonal control over contractility of the heart. We have some paracrine control. So we have um, in, across the entire vascular system, including the heart, because it's a pump plugged into, in communication with all these pipes. Uh, we have an entire, uh, we have the whole thing is layered with or coated with endothelial cells. Right, so we've got the blood compartment, and then a layer of endothelial cells, and then blood vessels. Smooth muscle. Or if you're in the heart, you've got like the ventricle, where you've got the blood compartment, a layer of endothelial cells, and the cardiac myocytes next to them. Okay? So you've got this layer of endothelial cells that is uh, in direct, uh, uh, lives with the muscle cells. And because they live close enough by each other, they can use paracrine as a method of communication. Okay? Endothelial cells um, were basically invented in like the 1980s. It was first discovered that this, end this endothelial cell layer was just thought to be a protective layer so that smooth muscle or cardiac muscle didn't get beat up by red blood cells because they're pounding away on the red blood cells are hitting the walls all the time. Turns out in 1980, discovered that these endothelial cells were actually releasing products that were affecting the cells nearby, okay? So 20, 30 years worth of work now, we've nailed down what endothelial cells are doing in part, but not, but not in total. And we'll see that coming up. So endothelial cells that line the heart, so these, these endothelial cells will release products. So one of the products that they will release uh, is endothelin, most potent vasoconstrictor um, in the body. So it's uh, non-lipid soluble, right? So as soon as I say it's non-lipid soluble, then that should tell you exactly what has to happen next, right? If I have non-lipid soluble and I want to communicate with the myocyte, I better have a membrane receptor population. There's probably going to be a second messenger, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so because it's non-lipid soluble, a little protein, we have to have endoth we have to have membrane receptors. And at the m there are two membrane receptor populations identified. We increase the second messenger. It happens to be IP3 which is going to very commonly, when you increase IP3 in a cell, that taps into sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium. Okay, so that's a pretty common uh, mechanism inside a cell. We're gonna increase calcium available for contraction. 
Okay, so we can increase contractility using endothelin. Uh, the endothelial cells most notoriously release nitric oxide. Very interestingly, what nitric oxide does, nitric oxide is a gas, so it's lipid soluble. Okay, so no need for a membrane receptor population on the myocyte. Okay, so it can gain access to the cell. It'll change a second messenger once it gets on the inside and change cell function. Okay. Um, but what it's actually doing is kind of a mystery. So about 50% of the literature will, will argue that they see an increase in force with myocytes exposed to nitric oxide, and 50% of the literature will talk about a decrease in force. Okay, so there's something amok here. Or there's something that we don't quite understand yet about how nitric oxide affects a cardiac myocyte. Okay, so this is awesome opportunity to get to grad school, figure this out, and then come back and tell me all about it. Okay, so there's definitely something here that we don't understand. Okay, so hormonal control as an extrinsic controller, paracrine, paracrine as an extrinsic controller, and then last but not least, uh, pressure or afterload as an extrinsic controller, okay? It's this notion that if I have high if I have a high afterload, are we, are we okay with afterload? or are we still uncomfortable with that? Sometimes it, do you remember what preload? If we're okay with afterload, I'll just continue to write, but if we're not okay, because afterload gives me fits as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so afterload is the volume present in the aorta that the ventricle has to work against. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It does, perfect, yeah, yeah, we're good. Afterload is the volume in the aorta that the heart has to work against. Okay, so then let me just check. Then why would a high afterload change cardiac, or why would a high afterload change cardiac output? Why would a high afterload affect stroke volume, that's what we're talking about here. Why would high afterload affect end systolic volume? What's the connection there? Because you're absolutely right, it is the pressure in that aorta, but why do we care? Perfect. So, so let's uh, let's switch that argument around a little bit and say, let's say force is constant. Oh, this moves. Let's say force is constant, right? And I have a normal afterload, then I'm going to get my normal ejection, right? I'm going to get my normal 80 mils out, my normal stroke volume. So let's say under that normal contractile force, I increase afterload. Right, so keep your force, you're, you're, you're exactly right, but you're changing force. Let's just keep force constant, because force isn't going to change until we change it. Right, what happens to my stroke volume if I increase after load? It's going to drop. Why did it drop? Yeah. You got to overcome that afterload before you can even open the aortic valve. So at the end of the day, the aortic valve opens later and closes earlier. You have less time to eject volume. Okay, so if it, if the afterload is 90 instead of so normally the afterload will be 80, right? As we get down to just before we're about to contract. Let's say the afterload is 100. Then my ventricle. Right, next beat has to contract, and when it gets to 80 millimeters of mercury, 
where normally that aortic valve would open and we'd start ejecting volume, not, it's not open. Because the ventricle has to generate 101 millimeters of mercury pressure to even get the valve open. But it's only contracting for a certain period of time. Right? That contractile time, we've never messed with that. That contractile time is a constant. Right? So if you've got 0.8 seconds to contract and get volume out, and I have my valve open for 0.6 of it, then I get a certain amount of volume out, right? But if I only go keep it open for 0.2, I just get less volume out, okay? So can you see the relationship between afterload and stroke volume? We will hit on this a couple more times because this, this is a tough one, okay? It's all about the timing. So if I get a high afterload, Therefore, I'm going to have to generate more, or I'm going to, uh, the pressure in the ventricle will have to be higher in order to eject volume, and will be ejecting, or in order to open that aortic valve. The aortic valve will be open for less time, therefore we will eject less volume, okay? Essentially that means a decrease in volume out per heartbeat. Right, and if the volume didn't go out, then the volume is in, right? If I didn't eject it, it's sitting in the ventricle, right? So this is gonna be then an increase in end systolic volume. I ejected less out, so I've got a decrease in stroke volume and a decrease in cardiac output. Okay, so we can affect uh, stroke volume and cardiac output by an extrinsic factor afterload, okay? Okay, so in terms of messing with cardiac output, we talked about how cardiac output was a product of heart rate and stroke volume. When we've changed contractility, we've been messing with stroke volume, right? But cardiac output is also affected by heart rate. Okay, you've already know, so if we think about heart rate as an effector of cardiac output, because cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, okay, so just so you know where we're at, why we're caring here. We've already gone over, very specifically, the neural control of heart rate. Okay, that's nervous innervation into nodal cells, right? So go back in your notes. This is just a recap of that. Parasympathetic nervous system affecting the SA node, changing permeability to potassium, changing our spontaneous depolarization rate. So you know a lot more about this than what I've written right up here right now. Okay, so go back, bring that information forward. That's where this, that information goes, okay? Similarly, the sympathetic nervous system um, using norepi to change the leak rate, change our spontaneous depolarization rate. Okay, so you've got a lot more information about that earlier. Bring that information forward and set it here. Okay? At the end of the day, we can increase or decrease heart rate, which is going to increase or decrease cardiac output. Right? So that's neural control over heart rate. We have hormonal control over heart rate. Okay, so this, this uh, should send up signals. If, I got, if I've got the sympathetic nervous system and norepinephrine at play, I have to have an, an adrenergic membrane receptor population sitting in there. And if I can tap into that nervously, I can tap into that hormonally too, because the sympathetic nervous system will stimulate the adrenal glands, release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream, and then whoever's got an adrenergic membrane receptor is going to respond to that, okay? And the AV node, the SA node will have them, therefore, uh, and uh, the membrane receptor has no idea where the epi or norepi came from, just that it's being stimulated. So it will do exactly what it's told to do when an adrenergic membrane receptor gets stimulated, okay? There's no differentiation between where that stimulation came from. And again, the body seems to be setting up 
especially with the sympathetic nervous system or with the adrenergic system, two time scales because we can change this on a milliseconds time scale. So heart rate can be changed on a milliseconds time scale. And then also on a seconds to minutes time scale through the bloodstream, okay? But there's this little weirdness about heart rate and the relationship with cardiac output, okay? So if I were to think about the relationship between cardiac output and heart rate and I were to look at this equation, I would say, okay, sure, when heart rate goes up, cardiac output goes up, right? I buy that. And then we did talk about that staircase phenomenon, right? That when heart rate went up, contractility went up. So heart rate was going to now increase stroke volume. Boom, double threat here, all right? We can increase, it, it'll increase not only heart rate, but stroke volume to increase cardiac output. Okay, so if I were to increase heart rate, uh, we would increase contractility. Call this staircase or the trap phenomenon. Increase contractility. Well, that's going to drop my end systolic volume because I ejected more out. Right? I ejected more out, so that means I must have increased my stroke volume. And I'm going to increase my cardiac output. That would make sense, right? But then I also, if I increase my cardiac output, I have now I've just increased my afterload, right? So that actually, increasing heart rate might actually have a negative effect on the next beat in terms of cardiac output, right? So where this would have a positive effect of heart rate on cardiac output, I think I could probably then dream up a scenario based on what we just talked about here, where if I increase my heart rate, we just said we would increase cardiac output, but then that means I'm going to increase afterload. All right. So that means I'm going to, if I've got an increase afterload, we just talked about how that's going to drop my stroke volume of my next, my next beat. Decrease the stroke volume of next beat. Okay, therefore, my next beat, I'm going to have a drop in cardiac output. Okay, so that looks like there may be a way in which an increase in heart rate might actually have a negative effect on cardiac output. And also, it's heart rate, right? If heart rate goes up really high, the times between heartbeats, so the times between contraction, is critical, right? So contraction, we talk about contraction being a really big deal, right? Because we're ejecting volume, perfect. But the time between contraction, we're filling the heart. That's equally important, because you can't pump what you don't have. If you don't let it fill, it doesn't matter how, much you, how hard you contract, you can't pump anything out. So filling time is really important too. So time between beats is as critical as the beat itself. So if I increase heart rate, I do drop my time between beats, right? I, I will decrease my filling time. If I decrease my filling time, I'm going to drop my end diastolic volume. And I can't pump what I don't have, OK? So there's another effect of heart rate. If I were to increase heart rate, I could see a scenario where I de uh, the this will decrease time between beats. So this is going to decrease my duration of diastole. All right, and that essentially, this is decreased filling time. Okay, and essentially, if I'm not full, if I have a decreased amount of volume, 
in diastole, I've dropped my preload. I've decreased my end diastolic volume. I didn't allow it to fill up enough. Decrease that preload or decrease end diastolic volume. And I can't pump what I don't have. Okay, so that's going to drop my stroke volume. It's going to drop my cardiac output. That, I think, will have a negative effect on cardiac output. So there is this interesting relationship between heart rate and cardiac output where when we look at it on its face, it doesn't look as straightforward as it might given this equation. So at the end of the day, what does heart rate do to cardiac output? You just have to do the experiment and see. Okay, so you just got, you got to get a heart. I'll try this at home. Pace it monitor cardiac output and then increase, slowly increase heart rate and look at what cardiac output is, okay? So when you do that experiment, this is what the data looks like. So if we actually look at heart rate in terms of beats per minute, and so this will be a paced heart, and we look at cardiac output and let's just put it as a percent so at some point we can get 100%. We'll just make it easier on ourselves here. And we go, we'll start at 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. We'll go up to 250, 550, 100, 150, 200. And we're pacing it so we can get it all the way up to 250 because a regular heart's not going to do that. Okay, when you do take the data, it looks like this. pretty complicated relationship, okay? But essentially what it means is if I've got these things where I see I've got positive effects of heart rate on cardiac output and negative effects, that obviously in this region the positives outweigh the negatives because there was a positive relationship between heart rate and cardiac output. As heart rate went up, cardiac output went up, right? So in this region the positives the issue with uh, heart rate itself, the number of times we're ejecting per minute, and that heart rate uh, contractility staircase argument, those must be stronger than these two. These must have a greater influence than these, all right? So the positives have to outweigh the negatives where the relationship is positive. Okay, and then you start to see this plateau region this is where the positives and the negatives must be equal, right? So now, afterload is starting to become a bit of a problem, okay? Now, filling time is starting to become a bit of a problem. But it's not the dominant problem yet because we still have the positive influence of that increase in contractility because of an increase in heart rate. Okay, so the positives must equal the negatives in this region. And then, of course, over here, the negatives are now outweighing the positives. So the effect of afterload, the effect of decreased uh, preload are starting to outweigh the, po the, effect, the positive effects of heart rate on contractility. All right? So interestingly enough, for those of you who train, the tipping point is about 180 beats per minute, right? So this, now, this relationship now starts to explain why when you train, you don't train your heart rate to just go faster, right? Does anybody know what kind of a normal couch potato right here active heart rate would be? Untrained? Any OHKers out there? Like, I can get my heart rate up to, like, 220. I can get it cooking. That is not good. All right, what does that mean? Stellar performance right out here, right? I am kicking my heart to pieces with no cardiac output, right? Untrained individual can get their heart rate up to 120 beats per minute. 
When you train, what do you do? Do you train and have it go higher? No, you train and have it go lower. Because you're optimizing your output per beat, right? So what you train is contractility. You make this thing work harder in terms of contraction, not faster in terms of rate. So an athlete who is trained, they will uh, train their heart to be able to be a uh, contractile machine, for sure. Really, lots of muscle, you'll, you'll train to increase muscle, be able to increase your contractility, but you will not train your heart to go up over 180 beats per minute because you start to lose effectiveness, because the negatives start to outweigh the positives there. Okay, so you will train. A trained heart rate will be less than an untrained heart rate, and this is the reason why. Okay? Any questions about this kind of love-hate relationship between heart rate and cardiac output? All right, so let's uh, just take a few minutes and recap before we break. All right, where have we been? So cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, and I'm going to bust stroke volume out to be end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. Okay, the focus on heart rate on cardiac output here is obviously because that's going to help us change mean arterial pressure. We talked about end diastolic volume and that this was really preload. Okay, volume in. We can't really talk much more about volume in because we've got to know about veins and venous return before we know about volume in. So we're going to hold that for a minute. Uh, we talked about end systolic volume, right? So we talked about how we could affect that through the sympathetic nervous system, right? We've got some control there. The parasympathetic nervous system, we've got some control there. We've got hormonal control. All right, into our end systolic volume. We did talk a little bit about paracrine. We're not going to use that as a huge, as a hugely important controller. And we have talked about afterload. And that'll continue to give us fits as we move forward, as we try to keep track of afterload. We talked about uh, sympathetic nervous system could affect heart rate. And the parasympathetic nervous system could affect heart rate and the hormonal system could affect heart rate. Okay, so we talked about that. Uh, we talked about how heart rate intrinsically, right, heart rate is going to affect stroke volume. That staircase phenomenon, right, increase heart rate, increase contractility. So we've got an effect there. And then we just talked a little bit about how heart rate can affect that end diastolic volume by that filling time argument, right? So think about filling time. Okay, and we also alluded to in that last discussion on heart rate and cardiac output, alluded to the fact that not all things have equal weight to them, right? Not all things have an equal gain of one in terms of control here. Some things have more control than others, okay? So there actually are more potent regulators of this system than others. So when you look at something like this, and you, not all of those have equal importance, okay? So when we think about the most potent regulators of the system, most potent regulators of the system will be uh, nervous and hormonal regulation will be the primary or the most potent. 
the next most potent regulation of the system will be things that are related to volume. Okay, so preload. Because you can't pump what you don't have. And then the third most potent regulators of the system will be pressure regulation. So after load. Okay, so we do need to put some of these into a little bit of a semblance of an order of importance. Okay, let's take a break and we'll get back to blood vessels after that. All right, uh, let's get back at it. We got about 15 minutes. All right, so I'm just going to look at this piece of paper. I'm not going to write on it, so don't feel like you have to find it. So again, back to where we've been. We've been thinking about the cardiovascular system in terms of our pumps, right? And essentially, we've been pumping out of the right heart up into the, cat, up into the pulmonary system. We've been pumping from the left heart into the systemic system, right? So now all of that cardiac output that we've been talking about, cardiac output of the left heart, that's been heading into <coughs> our systemic system, into our arteries, heading out into our systemic capillary beds, back into our veins, and hopefully to feed, to feed the right heart. Okay, so let, we, what we need to do now uh, is to think about where that cardiac output is going and to think about the different pipes in the system. When we talked about effectors and we talked about cardiac and smooth muscle, these pipes are all lined with smooth muscle. So they're going to be another effector that we have to go down and look at how do we change smooth muscle in order to change mean arterial pressure, okay? So we're going to be heading into looking at another tool, smooth muscle, okay? So let's first think about where cardiac output is going. So we're talking about cardiac output from the left ventricle that's headed into the systemic system, so this, so the whole point then was to get that blood that was in that heart flowing through the rest of the system, right? So what that pump did for us in terms of thinking about flow, we know that flow will happen if we have a pressure change. Okay, so if you've got an increased pressure here and a decreased pressure over here, you will get flow of fluid across the system, and it's inversely proportional to any resistance that we'll find in that system. What the heart did for us then, in terms of flow across the entire systemic system, was create the highest pressure the body has to work with. Okay, so the heart created P1. The heart created the highest pressure we have in the system in order to drive flow. Okay? That was that. The highest pressure in the system that the heart could generate was 120 millimeters of mercury, right, in that aorta. Systolic pressure. Okay, so now the aorta has that pressure, has that volume. So the rest of the system, the rest of the pipes, the rest of the systemic vasculature has to have lower pressure than that or else you get no flow, okay? So we start out with pressure in the aorta. If we look at the pressure changes, the pressure dynamics over the entire vascular system, plotted as diameter because as you... Uh, As you drop down, you'll get smaller diameter, and then as you go back up, you'll get larger diameter. 
So we'll look, uh, we start with aortic pressure. Okay, so this is what we were saying was approximately 100 millimeters of mercury. Right, that's what the heart did for us. That's the whole reason for that pump, okay, to generate that high pressure so that um, we could get flow through the large arteries, the uh, small arteries and arterioles, okay, down to capillaries. Pressure has to be dropping the whole time, right? P2 has to be lower than P1 or you get no flow, right? Capillaries will then drain into, uh, flow will go from capillaries to veins. So venous pressure has to be lower than capillary pressure or you get no flow, right? So they have to have a pressure drop across the entire system or you're not gonna get flow. So into veins, eventually to systemic venous pressure. It's about seven millimeters of mercury. Guyton will, and we will talk about this venous pressure, this seven millimeters of mercury as mean circulatory filling pressure. One of Guyton's huge contributions to physiology was figuring out what mean circulatory filling pressure was and how it affects the cardiovascular system. So mean circulatory filling pressure, venous pressure, seven millimeters of mercury. That blood then needs to be fed back to the right atria, correct? So the right atrial pressure has to be lower than seven millimeters of mercury, right? Or else there's no flow. If right atrial pressure is eight millimeters of mercury, all flow stops. Okay, because you don't have a pressure gradient for flow. So if you're in the venous system and you have seven millimeters of mercury and you need flow, then your right atrial pressure has to be less than that. It is about zero. Okay, so right atrial pressure, we've got to keep it low. It's got to be around zero. So the whole cardiovascular system uses that 120 or on average 100 millimeters of mercury pressure drop in order to get flow from the left ventricle into the aorta, all the way back into the right atria, okay? There has to be a pressure, the pressure has to be um, continually decreasing across the system or you're not gonna get flow, okay? So we need that pressure drop, critical first thing. What these pieces of tissue look like, you have lot huge in the cardiovascular so in the systemic vasculature which is kind of laid out here it's just this axis really okay you get a huge amount of divergence okay so you start with one aorta <coughs> excuse me which diverges into many arteries two times ten to the six arterioles and then 10 to the ninth capillaries. Okay, so huge divergence of this vascular tree. Okay. And then once we hit capillaries, a huge convergence to go from 10 to the ninth capillaries all the way back to two vena cava, an inferior and a su uh, superior that lead us back to the right atria. The radius of each of these vessels varies dramatically. You go from, in humans, like a 12 millimeter radius pipe, huge, all the way down to capillaries, four microns. Okay, very small tube here. 10 to the minus nine, or 10 to the nine of them, but very small. To the point where red blood cells actually have to fold up to get through them, okay? And then back up to two single or two larger pipes headed back to 
the right atria. Okay, so just to get a feel for the pressure drop and the types of vessels that we're talking about here, okay? All of these blood vessels, except one that we'll talk about, have um, a very classic cross section. So they'll have certain components to the blood vessel wall, okay? And the blood vessel wall will dictate how this, how this blood vessel behaves. So remember on day one, we talked about functional compartmentalization, that you needed the aorta to be a transport vessel. So its cross section or its wall is gonna be built in a very different way than the veins, which, mostly, which were mostly for storage, or capillaries for exchange, okay? So let's take a look at kind of what all of these layers are, and then we can talk about the variations of these layers depending on what compartment you're in and what you want that thing to do. Okay, so if we think about blood vessels, so each compartment will have different wall characteristics. Okay. Each compartment will have different wall characteristics, and all of the compartments have variations on the layers that we're about to talk about. Okay. So all have variations on these layers. So essentially, we, if we have this blood vessel, a piece of blood vessel, okay, we're looking at one side of one wall here, and that's what this cross section is down here. Okay, one side of one wall. And we're gonna look at what constitutes that wall. Okay, so for orientation, this then would be the blood side or the lumen of the tube, where we'll have blood flow. And then as we already talked about, we have this continuous layer of endothelial cells. Okay. And a basement membrane that they're attached to. Okay, so all blood vessels will have this layer. Capillaries only have this layer. Okay, so if you want to optimize a capillary for exchange, you just make it an endothelial cell layer sitting on a basement membrane, and that is brilliant for exchange, okay? So capillaries only have this layer. So capillaries only have that endothelial cell layer, and they are attached to that basement membrane, okay? Every other vessel, and the system is going to have the rest of these layers. Uh, that endothelial cell layer and the basement membrane layer is also called the intima. Intima will have elastin and connective tissue along with it. Okay, and then we have the media, which is made up of smooth muscle cells. So this is where we're getting smooth muscle cells wrapped around this tube so that when they contract, they will make the tube diameter smaller, and when they relax, they will make the tube diameter bigger. Okay, that's the game afoot when it comes to messing with smooth muscle. We're gonna make the tube lumen smaller or bigger, okay? So we've got this medial layer, smooth muscle cells, and neurons are there. We, are, we have sympathetic nervous system control over these, over these cells that we'll talk about. So we do have the nervous system coming in and they, in skeletal muscle, remember we had, the, we had one alpha motor neuron coming in and synapsing with, um, or creating a synapse on every skeletal muscle cell, so you had a neuromuscular junction. There are no neuromuscular junctions in the relationship between neurons and smooth muscles. The neurons come in and they have these regions where they release neurotransmitter and they flood an area. 
So there's no neuromuscular junction between nerves and smooth muscle. We just release it from many spots along the nerve and flood an area, okay? Primarily, this is the sympathetic nervous system coming in here. But we'll look at variations on that because that depends on whether you're an artery, an arteriole, or a venule. And then after that medial layer, we have this advent, what they call the adventitial layer. And that was really just thought to be structural prior to about 15 years ago. Thought to be structural to be able to allow things like nerves to come in. It does turn out that nerves, synapse here too, which is interesting because it's primarily the sympathetic nervous system that's releasing. It would be norepinephrine here, but why it's releasing it there is interesting. It must be communicating with some cell type there, okay? Uh, so there's been a lot of interest in what cell types are here. So we have part of our immune system up here, macrophages, fibroblasts. But this has become a really hot area of research because there seems to be a lot of cell types here. The nervous system is communicating with them, and these cell types, if you change their behavior, they live within the paracrine distance of smooth muscle cells. So just like these endothelial cells can affect smooth muscle function, adventitial cells may also be able to affect smooth muscle function. So they're looking at this area for potential control of blood vessel diameter. Okay, it's a big deal. Okay, we will look at the individual blood vessels on Thursday. <laughs>